meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right. A very good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gents. I'm Vikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge, UK, and one of the founders of Sikot Pania. And it's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar, logging in from all around the world. Now, in the COVID world of non-contact domains, we've certainly embraced digital competitiveness in Sikot with the launch of Sikot Pioneer. And through this platform, we've done over 50 events, and this is the 54th event today. And through the platform, we've actually got over 80,000 views from 110 countries all around the world. So a big thank you for joining us and also following us in our educational journey. Now, today's webinar is focused on hip replacements and dysplastic hip. And I'm really thankful to the HIP Committee Chair, uh, Oliver Marine Pena from Spain, the HIP Committee Vice Chair, Satish Kuti from the UK, the Indian Arthroplasty Association, Professor Sam Minal Gupta, and the IA Chief, Professor Roy, for actually putting this webinar together with a fantastic faculty. And I'll let Oliver introduce all of you to them in a minute. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible. So please do post in your questions as we go along. And if you can't join us today, then you can actually access this on our on-demand platform as well via the SICOT website. Once again, a big thank you to all of you for joining us. And I hand it over to Oliver to take over the proceedings. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you so much on behalf of SICOT and SICOT Pioneer, this wonderful platform for education all around the world. Uh, as you mentioned today, we have the honor to collaborate with the Indian Arthroplasty Association. That is a great pleasure for us to, to share this uh, knowledge with them about hip dysplasia. Um, we have this, uh, this topic that is a very interesting topic in all around the world. Everybody knows that it's a so difficult time to do a hip replacement in these dysplastic patients. And this uh, webinar is in a, in a global series of webinar in collaboration with SICOT uh, and other hip societies all around the world. This is the first one. And great thanks to the Indian Anthroplasty Association uh, for, for staying here for the first time. But we continue during Saturdays at the same time. The second one will be the Chilean Orthopedic Society. 
The next one would be the, from Argentina, Hip Society, Hip and Knee Society in, in May. The next one will be with the Colombian in, in August. And uh, finally, we'll have to be with the Asia Pacific Arthroplasty Society. So this is a global series, but let's start with the first one with our friends from the Indian Arthroplasty Association. And uh, as mentioned, because this is an interactive webinar. In the next one hour and a half, we will see several presentations, but please send your questions through the platform. I mean, we, we are happy to, to, to discuss your questions during the discussion time. And for sure, you will learn a lot from the discussion of this question. So please send your questions. Um, and we will start with the first part. And uh, I will introduce uh, Ronald Roy, the, the president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association, and Mirnal Sherman from India. Please, Ronan, your time. You're mute. Yep. Uh, thank you, Oliver. And uh, it's really very exciting for us at the Indian Arthroplasty Association to be collaborating with SIGOT for this webinar. And uh, I think all of us are looking forward to uh, having an exchange of views. And as you rightly mentioned, we're looking forward to a nice interactive session. I'll just go straight ahead and uh, introduce the faculty for the first half. Uh, we have Dr. Abhay Elhans, who is the head of AIMS, that's the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Jodhpur. Dr. Rakesh Rajput, who heads the Calcutta Hospital or the CMRI Hospital in Calcutta. Dr. S.S. Mohanty, who is the head of orthopedics and a former immediate former president of the IAA. Uh, in, um, and he is from the KIM Hospital in Mumbai. Then we have Professor Lewis P.K. Chan, who is uh, from Hong Kong, and Faki, uh, Fafati uh, Kukurdumas from uh, Turkey, who works at the university there. So uh, without any further ado, I'll pass you on to Satish, who's going to introduce the speakers for the second half. Over to you, Satish. Um, thank you, Ronan. The next half uh, is going to be interesting, too. Uh, and thank you to CCOT and to the Indian Arthroplasty Society for what's going to be a fantastic webinar. Professor Sen kicks off the second half. He's the immediate past president of the Indian Orthopedic Association. Manal Sharma, who's uh, part of our HIP committee, uh, is the head of AIMS Orthopedics uh, in uh, Faridabad. Uh, Absin Tehrazam is the associate professor of orthopedics from Tehran. Mohan Thadi is the head of orthopedics from AIMS in Kochi. And Rajiv Sharma is the head of orthopedics from Mulchand in Delhi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. So uh, let's uh, let's move to the to the first part. And uh, Ronan, the first presentation is, is from you. I will stop sharing my screen. You're mute. You're mute, Ronan. We have uh, Dr. Abhay Elhens, who's going to yeah. be taking over. So over to you, Abhay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Oh, good evening, all. So. My brief is uh, uh, to speak on total hip arthroplasty in dysplastic hips. And I'm going to basically speak on how to plan to do a hip in this difficult scenario. So all of us understand that uh, a hip owner with a dysplastic uh, uh, hip essentially is a sequelae of either a developmental dysplasia of the hip or a, a sequelae of an acquired dysplasia secondary to post-infection, post kifi post-perthes, and maybe sometimes uh, uh, traumatic separations of the capital femoral uh, epiphysis. Mm -hmm. What is important to understand and, and highlight here is that uh, once you're doing a preoperative clinical evaluation uh, of these patients, you have a, a young adult male with either a unilateral or a bilateral disease. They have very often have a spine deformity or they may or may not have. They have pelvic publicity, which may be correctable or which may be uh, 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 fixed. And a lot of them have limb blend discrepancies, which could be bony, anatomical, or functional. Coming to the uh, acetabulum morphology of uh, a dysplastic acetabulum, essentially the hip is shallow. It is small. It is antiverted. The acetabular socket is associated with the bone loss anterosuperiorly. So the medial and the posterior bone is the best bone of a small acetabular socket. 
And invariably, one finds an anterior posterior and a superior inferior mismatch because of the subluxation of the femoral head out of the socket and uh, secondary adaptive degenerative changes on the superior part of the socket. Coming to the femur side, these, the hip essentially uh, is excessively antiverted. It has a narrow intramedullary canal. The hip is in coxa valga. Sometimes in type 2 hips, there is a coxa vara situation as well, which can present similarly. And a lot of these hips have a deformed proximal femur, either a varus remodeling of the femur or a metaphysio-diaphysial mismatch of the proximal femur. But the most important thing to understand in the pelvic femoral is the contracture of the pelvic femoral musculature, which essentially defines which hips will require a subtrochantric uh, shortening or steotomy as the, uh, as the degree of dysplasia increases. So coming to, you know, uh, talking of what we need to do in a dysplastic hip situation, uh, we basically need to identify radiologically if the hip is dysplastic. And the two uh, armamentariums that we have in uh, the two uh, uh, angles that we have in our armamentarium are the tonus angle, which is essentially the inclination of the weight-bearing dome to, to the inter-tier drop line, and uh, the center is angle of Weiberg, which usually is more than 25. But if you have a, a hip center is angle less than 20 degrees, you've got to start thinking that this hip is dysplastic or it's got something going inside. Now, how do we quantify dysplasia? So there are essentially two classification systems. One and the most popular is the Crow classification system, which essentially is talking of the degree of subluxation of the femur head in terms of uh, the size of the established socket. And what in simple terms that means is that if the degree of head subluxation is less than 50% of the acetabular socket, you have a type one uh, Crow dysplasia. If it is between 50 and 75%, you have a Crow 2. If it is more than 75 and less than 100%, or there is some degree of uh, a head re uh, retaining contact with the native socket, it's a type 3. And if you have 100% or no contact of the femur head with the native established socket, it's a type 4. And this type 4 essentially has been quantified also into C1 and C2 categories based on the presence of uh, a pseudoacetabulum. Hartofila Kiddis did something similar uh, in the sense that uh, uh, they classified dysplasia into low and high types, wherein the type uh, uh, A, B, and C, or uh, 1, 2, and 3, Crow 1, 2, and 3, essentially uh, equivalent to uh, the low dysplasia, and the Crow 4s essentially are the high dysplasias. So what do, you, what do we need to do if we need to surgically plan what we need, what to do inside uh, this particular situation? So the basic decision making is to take into consideration that we have a shallow, uh, a small acetabular socket. So we're basically looking at special implants, especially the Bantam cup size 3840. If it's a shallow acetabulum, we need with a uh, very good medial and posterior, better medial and posterior bone with anterior superior deficiency, then we are looking at medializing the acetabular socket. And so as to get a uh, reasonably good host bone coverage, uh, uh, so as to get good uh, primary cup stability. And we have to understand that it is the anteroposterior diameter of the acetabulum rather than the superior inferior diameter, which will help us size uh, our, an, our acetabular socket. So it's the uh, true floor of the acetabulum, the native anatomic center of the acetabulum, which we are chasing most of the times. But in some conditions, especially the type 2s and the type 3s are situations where one can accept a slightly higher hip center as well. So the surgical planning uh, of a, a total hip arthroplasty in a dysplastic hip situation essentially aims at doing three things. One, restoring the center of rotation to where it belongs. Second, getting the combined antiversion right. Third, uh, getting the weight bearing axis and correcting the limb length discrepancy as far as possible. And how we go about doing it? is the type 1 establums essentially will get a primary uh, a joint without any uh, special implants uh, required for this situation, except that they would need socket medialization. And the hip goes into the anatomic hip center. 
This type 2 and the type 3 uh, acetabulums are essentially those where uh, the hip socket uh, uh, will be medialized and uh, sometimes to get away from uh, uh, getting in doing a subtrochantric osteotomy and especially uh, those hips where there is uh, a trochantric overgrowth and a trochantric overriding, those are the situations where one will need to you know, kind of accept a slightly higher hip center, maybe a 1.5, 1 to 1.5 centimeters higher hip center, so that one avoids uh, doing a subtrochantric osteotomy. And also because that is the best bone uh, in the nate, in the establer socket. And, and Ranavath sorry. has published uh, adequately sorry, on that. Sorry. Go to the home message, please. Yeah. Okay. So the type fours, essentially, we need the medialization where you're looking at the cup coverage. And we are looking to correct the different forms of uh, limb dense discrepancy and uh, looking to address the, the basic femoral morphology defects, which is uh, the antiversion, the coxa valga, the narrow canal, and the deformed proximal femur. So uh, to conclude, uh, uh, essentially, uh, what we are looking to do is uh, uh, on the establer side that we have a shallow establer socket, which can be diagnosed by these angles. We have a hyperplastic socket, which might need a bantam socket, which is a size 38 or a 40. We have associated bone deficiency, which might require reaming medially and performing a cotyloplasty by one of the techniques by Dunn, Hartophilokidis, or Daw, and restoring the anatomic hip centers in a type 1, type 4 establum and, the, and accepting a high hip center in type 2 and type 3s. Thank you. On the femur side. We move, sorry, we need to move to the next presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. Oh. And okay. please stop sharing and go to the next presentation. Shall I do screen, screen share? So am I audible and visible? Yes. Okay. Am I audible? All good, Rakesh. Please proceed. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, Abhay has already covered a lot of points. So I'll probably skip some of this. But these are the things what we are waiting for to cover with uh, what sort of implants we're going to use. And I think we need to ask some questions before we go around and actually trying to tackle these issues. One, on the cup side, we are going to ask ourselves, are we going to put in a cemented or an uncemented implant? Uh, are we going to use the anatomical or the high rib center? We are going to use the standard cups or we're going to use the highly porous cups. What cup size are we going to use? What liners are we going to use? And bone grafts are not. On the stem side, what we're going to ask is, are we going to use the standard stems or we need the stems which are a bit more versatile? We're going to use proximal fit stems like we do uh, quite commonly or we do distal fit like we do in revision scenarios or we need, need stems which will actually cover both these areas. Again, do we need to have cemented stems or uncemented stems? Do we need shortening osteotomy or not? Plates or not? Custom made or 3D printing will be the another thing to add on to it. So I think I'll just answer briefly all these questions in this uh, this one slide itself. So from the cup side, I think you can use cemented cups in these cases, but they have only moderate success. Uncemented, highly poro coat cups are slightly better. And Abhay has already mentioned that 30 and 40 cups are the pretty standard cups for these ones. So go and book always the lower size cups becoming very difficult because many companies have now withdrawn the 22 heads. So it's very difficult to get hold of these cups now. And you are allowed to go high hip center, but there's only to limit to which you can go about 2.5 centimeter. And some authors have gone up to three, but that's about it. And this is for grade two and three. So you can go for anatomical estabulum if you have grade four, come back to the native estabulum. You need to avoid bone grafts as possible, but there will be some cases you will have to use bone grafts. You need to medialize estabulum nearly for all the cases, uh, including the uh, type 1 and type 4 also. And you need to, what you need to avoid is going up and out. So that's one thing which you really want to avoid in these cases. And you need to use modern polyliners because you're going to have already very small cups. Uh, because you won't have very good control over the antiversions and also the inclination. So perhaps avoid ceramic on ceramic articulations. Regarding the stem, the, you need to have stems which are more versatile, which will give you proximal and distal fixation predominantly. If you are in a default scenario where you cannot get proximal, at least you need to get a distal fixation. So the standard stems will fail in midterm to results. And the reason for that is because the proximal part bit is very narrow and only that you get a distal fixation. And then in the midterm, you get fatigue failures. You need stem which will overcome this. 
uh, proximal and distal mismatch. You also need to do quite commonly septocantic shortening osteotomy. So you need stems which will accommodate that. You also need to have version freedom because many of these hips are at least 10 to 15 degrees more antiverted than normal. So you're looking at almost 25, 30, 40 degrees of antiversions and your stem may need to derotate for that reason. So, and occasionally when you uh, have done the osteotomy, you probably find that sometimes the control over distal fragment isn't very great and occasionally plates are needed to overcome that. And cemented stems can be done, but they're not very common. So regarding the cup, uh, this is the article which actually tells us that cemented cups can be done, but after 10 years, they begin to start failing very rapidly. But if you combine cemented cups with bulk bone grafts, the longevity of these cups can be increased. What about these cementless cups in this scenario? And the answer is they have got very good studies, at least to 9.8 years, you can see from Kamada studies, no failures. Similarly, if you are looking at Pro 1 hips, this is the way to go. Medialize your cup, as Abhay has just said, go two and three. I'll skip this uh, thing, but you have actually four options in this one. The first option is doing bulk graft, medialize the cup slightly and cover the rest of it by bulk graft. In the second one, you can now a higher hip center. And this is what predominantly current uh, thinking is. This is not a new concept. It was there, went out of the window and has come back. Uh, and most surgeons have started choosing this as their go-to option. You can also do a controlled estabuloplasty, which means you fracture the medial wall very gently. You take that medial wall fragment inside. But there are problems with this. And particularly if you come to revision, there's nothing left of it. So this was uh, initially described by Dunn and Hess and popularized by Larry Dawes Group. The fourth option is using rings. And again, they have got reasonably good success. But remember, these patients are very young and you probably need to do something thinking revisions also in long term. And in crow four, uh, four hips, I think because you don't have an estabulum on top, very very good quality bone. So you need to come back to the native estabulum. But when you come, as I said, you have a lot of structures which are shortened. The sciatic nerve will be stressed out. So you need to do a subtrochantic osteotomy. What about monoblock stems? And you can do this monoblock stems, but you can't do the standard monoblock stems. You need to do a bit modified like a Wagner cone. And these are the two studies which will tell you that the Wagner cone also has got a reasonable, uh, good studies uh, showing with this. What about modular stems? And I think, as I said, the morphological problems, if you want to overcome the increased vulgars, the increased antiversion, subtrochantic osteotomy. And for most of the surgeons, I think this SROM type stems are the go-to stem for these cases. And again, these two studies will tell you that they have got very good success rates uh, when done appropriately. What about the cemented stems? If you look at the studies from uh, uh, Atul Joshi from the Wrightington group and also from the Hubble uh, and uh, Joel pa uh, the Hubble and uh, Matthew Hubble papers uh, from the Graham G and uh, Robbie Ling uh, Center in Exeter, they have got very good results. And I've personally been there and I've seen them doing it actually. So it can be done. But again, they themselves will tell you that these are for uh, some cases only, not for all of them. Um, this is the paper from Chris Hovey, which actually tells us that if you do cemented for socket and stem, the socket somehow doesn't do very well, but the stems still do very well. And you only had 9% revisions, whereas the socket uh, revision was almost 20%. So stems do well, the sockets don't do that well. Please go to and, the uh, slide. Sorry? Go to the last uh, slide, please. Yeah. So maybe I've just gone backwards. Okay. So what about the customized fibular process? I think this is the in, in, in thing to be thinking. What about the bearing? So metal on metal bearing is the one which is giving us trouble, but ceramic on uh, ceramic bearings, the ceramic on poly and uh, metal on poly bearings all have got very good results. So uh, this is the way to go forward with them. Whether you have grow one, two, three, the stem is very sack. The, so, the, the socket size, I think, uncemented, very small size is the way go forward. Sometimes you do have issues with these stems, but you need to overcome. The complication rates uh, on the stem sites are very high. So thank you. Thank you for keep on time. Thank you so much. That's important for to manage this webinar. And Ronin, let's move to the next presentation. Uh, well, the next one we've got uh, Subhangshu speaking on acetabular reconstruction and its options in dysplastic hips. Over to you, Subhangshu. Thank you, Vikas, Oliver, and Ronin. Uh, greetings from Mumbai, India. So I'll focus on the acetabular reconstruction in dysplastic hips. So the complexity of reconstruction depends on the degree of anatomical abnormality, be it a dysplasia, be it subluxation or a dislocation. The anatomic changes, which has already been highlighted, I again emphasize that in a dysplastic, there is a shallow and slopic acetabulum and the deficient superolaterally as well as the anteriorly. 
and uh, the AP dimension is less compared to the super infrared dimension. Hence, the cup position is decided by the AP diameter or AP dimension of the acetabulum. There is a poor bone quality, especially worse changes in subluxation because these bones are not loaded because of subluxation or dislocation. The preoperative planning, one need to draw the inter drop line, that is the reference line, then draw a line at an angle of 40 to 45 degrees to show that is the inclination of the acetabulum. Then a draw a line at the superior margin of the normal acetabulum. As, as you can see that these two blue lines are converging or diverging. That shows there is a deficiency in the acetabulum. So if you draw another line, this yellow line, which is drawn from the super margin of the normal acetabulum, Parallel to this inter drop line, it shows that uh, this is the amount of deficiency which is there superlaterally. That needs to be filled up with the graft or augment or something like that. And if you draw the colors line, it brings out a good triangle there. So your acetabular cup placement has to be in this triangle in order to rest up the center of rotation in this kind of hips. The components what you need to keep, uncemented components are preferred and especially one need to see that in your inventory there is a small diameter cup like 38 outer diameter cup is ready in their inventory but if you're using the socket size less than 46 millimeter then uh, better to go for a 22 millimeter head in order to have a good thickness of polyethylene unless you are using ceramic and ceramic and as i told you that location of the socket is important and that one need to plan before the surgery the type 1 dysplasia, one need to restore the center of rotation to through acetabulum and what is described is cartiloplasty. One has to ream the acetabulum vertically, reach the floor of the acetabulum, then change the direction and go on to the posterior wall because posterior wall contains a good bone stock there. And so you have to ream medially as well as the posteriorly in order to achieve a good bone stock for the cup placement. So this is a case, a young lady, 46 year, a type 1 dysplastic hips, as you can see the planning. So there is a good bone stuck medially, one has to remit and go into the medial wall and then go posteriorly. There is a possibility of uncoverage of the cup there in the laterally. And that is the lateral view of this pre-operative x-ray of this patient. And that the post-operative x-ray of the patient, 46 cup has been used. And as you can see here, it has been deemed under you know, normal center of rotation has been achieved. Sometimes you may tend to put the cup little superficially as it has happened in this 20-year-old male. It's a superficial cup that it has not been rimmed adequately until the medial wall. So in these type of cases, the cup is superficial. So there is a possibility of high joint reaction forces and that may lead to early failure. So one has to reach and medialize the cup so that in order to achieve a good, you know, joint reaction forces, so early failure is prevented. Next comes the subluxation that is type 2 and type 3 of the Crohn's classification. One need to prefer uh, to restore the hip center of rotation, but a mild elevation of the hip center is acceptable until about a centimeter or 1.5 and half an inch. The structural femoral head autograph may be needed in some cases, but avoid placing the graft beyond the lateral margin of the component. As you can see here, it's a type 2 where there is a graft has been put, but the graft has been placed beyond the margin of the cup. In this kind of cases, this graft gets reshaped over the period of time and the screws become loose. And because these grafts are not loaded in the weight bearing region. So the ideal placement of the graft, one need to take the head, divide it the head, then prepare the acetabulum, burn the acetabulum, and they put the head there with a couple of screws. And one must uh, see that the the trabeculae must be aligned along the weight bearing axis in order to graft uptake will be better. So for this, you know, animation, so first dislocate the hip, then put the graft superlaterally, then fix with the screw, then put the cup, then reduce the hip. And that is an uncemented kind of cup, whereas when graft has been put, the direction of the screws has to be towards the sacroiliac joint and along the trabeculae of the bone. And no part of the graft should be overhanging beyond the margin of the cup. That means that graft is unloaded and that will get reserved. And this graft will not get reserved and will have a high uptake there. So if the you know contact of the host bone is less than 60%, then one need to use a cemented type of cup. So you divide the graft, the head like that, then put the graft there superlaterally with K wire and couple of screws there, then cement a plant type of cup there so that uh, you know the graft is loaded and that is a post-operative X-ray of this patient after a cemented type of hip. Of course, nowadays, trabecular metal cups which are available and they help in the, even if less than 50% contact is there, 
then that is acceptable. The finally, the type four or dislocation one need to restore the anatomic hip center as far as possible and here the use of ball grafts or nowadays trabecular metal augments which are available may be helpful and these augments uh, you know uh, you need to augment the porotic intraacetabular bone with impacts and cancellous autografts and they avoid medial wall perforation which is controversial which has been done by Durr et al so one can use either a graft or a augment in the superlateral position so uh, this is a pro type 4 in 20 years old male and here no graft has to be put because cuff coverage was good and uh, uh, the, both in AP and lateral view, that is a seven years follow up of this patient. What Larry Doretal has published that uh, to do a medial wall perforation. So, in order to have a complete containment of the cup, which is controversial, but here you can do a controlled medial wall perforation and put some cancellous graft medially for the complete containment of the cup. So, the take home message is that. In dysplastic acetabulum, there is a small anteroposterior dimension compared to superior infra diameter. The anteroval deficient and one has to rim medially as well as the posteriorly. The acetabulum rimming has to be directed posteriorly and one need to learn the bone grafting technique in order to fill that superolateral graft using a ball graft from the head of the femur which is already available or else nowadays one can use the trabecular metal or titanium mesh augments. And the aim is in pro type 1 and 4 to restore the center of rotation and pro type and two, type 2 and type 3 accept the high hip center. I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Subrangshu. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. We, I think we'll deal with them uh, during the break in between. And I'll ask Dr. Chan to talk about high hip center versus native hip center in dysplastic total hips. Well, thank you for the chairman for the introductions. The principle of estimate reconstruction in this past hip is not different from other hip pathology. The aim is to reconstruct the asthmatic cup at the native anatomical asthmatic locations to restore the normal offset, center of rotations, and hip biomechanics. The difficulty in cup placement in this past hip increases as the severity of the hip dysplasia increases as in crowds for this past hip. One of the main reasons is due to the poor bone stock at the true asthma to support the cup. Let's take an example. This is a Chinese patient with arthrogryphosis with bilateral cross for dysplastic hip referred to me to, to, for total hip arthroplasty. We aim to put the cup and native hip center. From this x-ray, I hope you can appreciate the bone surrounding the native hip center, especially the idiom is osteoporotic and relatively non-supportive. To support the cup in native hip center, it's not uncommon to use additional reconstruction techniques, as mentioned by previous speaker. We use a shell autograph here, and sometimes we also need to consider to use the metal or almond to support the cup superiorly. Another option is to, is to put the cup in high hip center. We more host bones surrounding the cup at high hip center, as additional reconstruction techniques to support the cup can be minimized. How high is the height? There's no general consensus. In general, reconstruction of hip center, 35 mm higher than the inter tier drop line is considered as high hip center. Everything has pros and cons. Although high hip center is technically easier, studies confirmed potential drawbacks of this tennis. First, at the time is insufficiency. It's not uncommon for the hip center being lateralized also in high hip center. When the hip center is naturalized, the length of the abductor moment arm decreases. To maintain the moment arm balance, the abductor has to exert a higher force in the moment arm, such this so that it results in abductor ins insufficiency and weaker abductor and gauge disturbance as shown here. Because of higher abductor force in the moment arm, it will also result in higher joint reaction force as shown in the force diagram here. In computer simulation model, it was also shown that high hip center will result in decreased hip wing thrombosis, especially hip fractures and internal rotations, and also it will also have an increased chance of anterior impingement, resulting in higher chance of dislocations. It's also difficult to achieve leg length equalization in high hip center when compared with native hip center, as shown in this X-ray. Male kinetic experience also showed that High hip center will result in 
increased loosening rate of the total hip as uh, expanded by increased strong reaction force in the hip, in the high hip center. So in some of the cohort, it's very funny to see that despite the problem discussed before, some offers still show good long-term results with high hip center tennis as the one of one of two representative uh, journals as shown here. To achieve good long-term results, this offer suggests to put the cup just a little bit high. The hip centers was recommended to be less than 35 mm from the inter joint line and medialization of the cups towards the external floor. This test was shown, this study of mildly elevated hip centers can increase the whole spoon coverage and simplify the external reconstructions, but still achieve a good long-term result. Let's go back to our case. My personal preference, no matter in class one to class four, is to have the hip in the native hip center. With modern techniques as shown here, such as the robotic assist technology, native hip center can be easily planned and accurately restored and accurately executed as shown here. So let's go to the home message. In this past hip, as some reconstruction to achieve native hip, hip center is the first priority. Although high hip center can increase the whole smooth coverage to the cup, you need to understand the potential problems associated with high hip center as shown here. If you consider high hip center, it's recommended to be just a little bit high, less than 35 mm from the interstitial line and medialization is the key. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, that was an excellent uh, discussion on uh, the disadvantages of a high hip center. And I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Fateh from Istinia University in Turkey to talk about the role of subtrapentanic osteotomy in dysplastic hips. Over to you, Dr. Fateh. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this exceptional uh, faculty. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the subtrapentanic osteotomy in dysplastic hips. Um, so the indications of the uh, osteotomy is um, if there will be an ac unacceptable lip lengthening after the fixation of the um, femoral component or the hip, uh, hip replacement prosthesis into its place, if reduction of the hip re results um, of the limb lengthening of three or four centimeter, which is commonly seen in crow type four or some crow, uh, crow type two uh, hips, then it's indicated. It's not indicated if conventional uh, hip uh, performed and it's if the acetabular component uh, can be placed in a desired uh, location and the femoral component can gain a good fixation without uh, excessive lengthening of the hip, so it's not indicated. But in those crow type four and threes, it's it is usually not possible. So uh, I will talk about the surgical technique very quickly. So after taking the X-rays, we should make a plan in 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 such a challenging cases because otherwise that will have a lot of challenges during the surgery. First, we make the femoral negastiotomy, like approximately one centimeter. Uh, proximal to the uh, lesser trochanter, and then we prepare without making an osteotomy. Um, uh, we, we, we make a reaming, uh, and then calc we calculate the subtrochanteric um, bone from the unspaded um, cut, um, shortening. And uh, then after that, we elevate uh, the, the vastus lateralis uh, uh, or split it, and perform the osteotomy uh, from there in order to keep the vascularity well we have to make it uh, without like stripping all the soft tissue and it's the 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 first osteotomy is usually about 10 centimeter uh, distal from the tip of the uh, girded trochanter but it's always um uh, case based, and it have to you have to make a plan before the surgery, and we leave uh, the a uh, distance approximately enough to the uh, to, to uh, the um, uh, to the um, prosthesis because after the osteotomy, the the prosthesis that is um, that is for the distal segment should be uh, long enough to engage with the distal segment. 
and we place the trial component after we prepare the proximal. And then uh, with a gentle traction, we can see and confirm the, our pro operative plan for the second osteotomy line. Then we reduce the hip and then we do this for sure. And uh, if if the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the hip cannot be reduced after the proximal cut of the osteotomy, we may Re, uh, repeat the osteotomy line proximally, and, or we can release the tight anterior capsule or other uh, facial bands, adductor muscles, and or psoas tendon because they are very tight uh, in, in those high hip uh, uh, dislocations. And the uh, fit of the stem to the proximal fragment and all these trials can compromise the, uh, the, the proximal segment. So we have to be careful about during all these trials. <clears throat> Sorry, they uh, split after after we make the both proximal and distal osteotomies. Uh, we we have a cylindric uh, bone graft, and uh, we have to split into two in this uh, case. Uh, and then we have to keep in mind that to to protect the vascularity of these two um, segments fragments are important because we are aiming to. To, to have a union there, and those two uh, vascular bone grafts will help us in, in, in this union. And then we place a, a circulized cable. This is important to keep this circulized cable here prophylactically to prevent the fracture because the distal segment uh, can, can undergo a fra a, a, an interoperative fracture as a complication, which will be difficult to handle. And uh, then we prepare the this part for sure with impacting the osteotomy site. And we should be very careful about that impaction uh, process. And in order to achieve a good bone contact in the osteotomy line, we have to be careful about the um, the good contact of the bone. And so in for transverse osteotomies, which is our technique in our clinic, we, 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 we have to... We, we, uh, are very careful about the good contact nuts and oblique and the transverse line do not sit into each other. But if we make it parallel, uh, the osteotomy lines parallel to each other, that contact is uh, is usually very sufficient. And the addition of the the graphs from the the, the other uh, around around the osteotomy line with two cables usually work very well. At that moment, before placing uh, the, the the component into its final position. Uh, we have to be uh, careful about the rotational alignment and the stability in order to avoid the um, ununion and uh, optimal hip stability because if we uh, do not be careful about the the rotational alignment then and hip uh, motion uh, limitation or more importantly dislocation is is seen so what type of stems are are uh, usually um uh, suitable for such a uh, procedure, extensive porous coated or fluted, or the square type of stems are are good because distal locking, the diaphyseal locking is important in order to uh, to stabilize the distal segment of the osteotomy. Postoperatively, we allow patients to toe touch uh, weight bearing for six to eight weeks, and then we follow the radiological union. And based on that the union, uh, uh, we allow them to weight bear. And some surgeons also use abduction uh, brace, but we don't use it in our clinic. There are a lot of discussions about the placement of the grafts or the configuration of the osteotomies. Uh, I explained in the surgical technique about the transverse osteotomy, which, uh, which is our um, routine in our clinic, but there are a lot of discussions about that. Technically, we find the, um, the, the other um, um, osteotomy configurations um, not superior. In our experience, also it's technically demanding, and the, the, the placement of the grafts uh, uh, do not uh end up with 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 significant difference according to many many uh, there is no conclusive conclusive uh, uh result in the literature um the transverse osteotomy is easy to handle but the antiversion uh and, and the antiversion uh, is easy to correct because it's transverse and you can adjust uh the fine adjustments are possible but it's disadvantageous minimum contact 
and the rotational stability is a question mark. Oblique osteotomy has a larger contact between the fragments, but rotational instability is also a question because if you do not make it very precisely, then the contact will be really um, not good. And in Sharon osteotomy, the, the uh, bone fragments or the, the stepwise osteotomy, uh, the, the, the contact is great and the rotational stability is good, but technically it's complicated. There, I also want to mention how we learn in technique. Okay, last last uh, slide. So, in conclusion, the, we have to be uh, we have to uh, be careful about the, these uh, techniques. Sufficient distal engagement is good, and the grafts should be protected in terms of vascularity. And the configuration is based on the experience of the surgeon. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Fateh. Thank you so much. Uh, Can you stop sharing, take, please? Sure. Thank you. Right, uh, uh, Oliver, do we have any time for a short discussion then? Sure, we have 10 minutes for discussion. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, I, there's a question from the audience, uh, and I think I'd like uh, uh, Dr. Mohanty to answer this, uh, as to how would one... Uh, uh, locate the acetabulum in a dysplastic hip. Okay. So, you know, pro type 1 is not a uh, problem. Type 2 or type 3 is also not a problem. Type 1 is always the hip is in situ, so there should not be a problem. Yeah, type and the 3 two, and 4, three, that's what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, so what we're talking about, type 3 and 4. So what, uh, you yeah, need to one need to have a shiam there, one need to put, uh, after dislocation, one need to put a spike or one, uh, you know, woman's retractor at the supra estabular margin. First, locate the transverse estabular ligament and put a spike there or a woman's retractor there. That is the internal margin of the cup. There will be a lot of fibrous tissues all around. One needs to clear those fibrous tissues. And it's a uh, good, uh, you know, aid that keep, keep a image intensifier and check it uh, under image and transfer to look at the acid development and clear it. Dr. Sen, do you have any other uh, ways of using it? No, exactly defining the tail and defining the area to go in between and on that basis we try to find it out. That is the only way we feel that we are near the center where we have to be. And always there's a laser bone between the, if there's a false acetabulum, there's a laser bone between the false acetabulum and the true acetabulum. That, that gives to, we have to go in front to the laser bone. Right, Mrinal, you were, you were saying? So, so if we, if we follow a rent in the capsule, once you've got given incision in the capsule and you insinuate your finger, it will take you to the original acetabulum because the capsule is attached there and you follow it to the tal. You can also follow the ligamentum teres if it is there. And obviously, the CR, which has been told by Dr. Mahanti, is also helpful. Yes. So, I mean, the CR and the ligamentum teres, I think, would probably be uh, the most common methods that most of us tend to use. Anyone has any other views on how to do it? Yes, Rajiv? Yeah, Mandal. Uh, I find it very useful uh, if you put a bone bone lever uh, just below the uh, teardrop in the, in the notch. Now, that is a very definitive uh, uh, trick for me because then you know that what is your lowest level of the uh, of the cup and then you you can you can dissect around that and it will be very easy after this right uh, rakesh uh, coming to implants uh, do, do you, you uh, what percentage do you use cemented cups if at all um Ron, as I said recently, actually, I did use a cemented cup because uh, I don't know whether you realize the Indian market, there is hardly very difficult to find a small size cup now because 22 heads have been withdrawn by many companies. So you're invariably pushed into a cemented socket. But if you get hold of, then of course, uncemented implant. But my first go would be an uncemented cup. What's it like, for Dr. Chan, in your part of the world? Uh, uncemented cup. Uncemented in, in almost all cases. In all cases. Right. Satish, what about you? Yes, it's uncemented in all cases, yes. Right, Renal, yes? Yeah, Dr. Rakesh, what is your stem of choice in uh, this plastic hips? When would you prefer a solution stem, a Wagner stem, 
or uh, s rom so solution stem never uh, i have gone away from solution stem for literally everything uh, wagner cone particularly if you have almost like a cylindrical uh, stem where there isn't a too much of a mismatch between thing so because you know if you want my go to stem actually for all these cases is s rom so where i can't put s rom i would go for wagner but for s rom you need to have at least 2 is to 1 diameter so you need to have like 2 cm on top 1 cm on bottom because you need to have accommodation for the comb and the stem but if you can't do that then you will just shatter the proximal femur that's what happened in my last case so you know in that cases you're better off starting up straight away for a wagner the option and any other uh, uh, ideas from you any thoughts uh it was very interesting talking and a very good discussion i enjoyed no more comment i have right. a comment yes sir bhai <clears throat> so there are two situations you know ideal go to stem is the s rom we practically walked away as rakesh said from the solution and there are certain situations where the cone wagner is a great uh, stem to use and those are specifically when uh, in certain situations of type 2 type 3 uh, displaced dysplastic hips where you have the tip of the greater trochanter which is higher than the center of rotation of uh, the head and the neck shaft is is in, in a kind of a varus those are situations where you need to have a lower neck cut and those are situations where you need a stem with a, a smaller uh, a smaller neck and that is where the wagner is of great use the other situation is where uh, if you have a very good combined antiversion of more than 50 55 then you can go in and straight away do a cone wagner if you have walking into a situation where your combined antiversion is lesser than 50 then probably the best thing to use is modularity and an s rom stem tatish would you tend to agree uh, yes uh, i i i tend to use wagner for all my cases and i find that even even in a subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy i find that the splines really lock into the two different segments and you get a very good tight fit and it's very stable uh, that's the one that's my go to stem for all my uh, um, ddh cases great can i, can I uh, yes shubhran sir please J- just to add with along with that uh, i always keep a cemented cdh stem in my you know uh, theater that because i can adjust the offset i can adjust the length etc with the cemented stem so if uh, it is not possible to do with the uh, uncemented though my first preference would be cementless wagner or if we some what has been discussed always keep a cemented stem in your theater which will be helpful it may be a bailout situation ronan yes all the question in the chat uh, for uh, fatit it's about the the osteotomy the subtrochanteric osteotomy uh, yes. and also the question could be for all the panel uh, are there any key point in the pre op planning just to check that you have to do it for sure uh, are there any point that you measure or you mention that you go forward for this subtrochanteric osteotomy so yes uh Um, operatively we have to to check the first the x-ray ep x-ray and we compare uh the the how high is the the uh dislocated side and if the uh, uh yes there is a soft tissue soft tissue tension there but with a, with attraction if you cannot place the components in place without um uh, lengthening the uh, extremity more than 4 cm so it is it is the uh, indication for for a subtrochanteric osteotomy and uh, in type 4 and type 3 crow type 4 and 3 uh, hips are highly uh, likely to make uh, oste- osteotomy in this in this uh, uh, measures so you mean But, you do a preoperative x-ray with traction yes that's what i just going yes. to ask yeah <laughs> yes that is important because Uh, it is important to make a little traction because you have to see the final position of the uh dislocated hip after that gentle traction yes rajiv yeah the rough assessment could be that when your lesser trochanter is above the level of the tear drop yeah now these are the cases where you have to keep in mind that probably in this case subtrochanteric osteotomy will be important right from the beginning itself 
that's on attraction view presumably right yeah right, right. Abhay, anything else to add yeah yes. so uh, there are a couple of other things uh, so two more situations so one very good broad guideline as dr rajiv said is if your lesser trochanter is above the level of uh, the teardrop yes, you're and- probably walking into an osteotomy secondly if you have a corrective shans kind of an osteotomy in the proximal femur those hips yeah. will need a subtrochanteric osteotomy yes sure thirdly yes. the other condition is that you have certain hips where the uh, the hip has is in very severe valgus and uh, the neck is overgrown so uh, with that kind of a severity of the valgus if you see the center of rotation of the head and the center of rotation of the establer socket and if it's right. more than 3.5 cm the cut short we're running out of time i just ask him to yeah. just make a, a closing comment so i've said right. uh, last comment from you All right. Thank you very much, Fatih. I want to know what do you do for prevention of uh, non-union. That major major concern is uh, uh, the problem with the uh, subtrochanteric osteotomy. So there are uh, three things that we 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 consider for prevention of the um, non-union. One, the distal fixation, the stability of the distal fixation, and uh, the uh, the uh, graft stability. that is fixed with the cables and the contact of the bone surfaces in the osteotomy side thank you well thank you gentlemen i'll pass you on to satish to take it over for the next next half over to you thank satish thank you ronan thank you ronan we move to the next uh, segment of this webinar we co-chairing with uh, dr Ra- rajkumar natishan who is the ia secretary so let's introduce the first speaker is professor ramesh sen from uh, chandigarh the ex uh, sorry the immediate past president of ioa uh, and he's going to talk about uh, arthroplasty in low dysplasia professor sen thank you so when we are looking at uh, arthroplasty in uh, this kind of a situation we understand we are looking for the anatomical alteration at this level we are looking for the technical steps we have already talked a lot about all of them i'll just be making them in a brief so we are not in a high situation we are not in a local dysplasia it is a overlapping of the false vestibulum with the reduced depth so with these two kind of a situation when we have got the head at a superior margin and vestibulum is shallow looking at all now we have increased antiversion also posterior bone stock is less and there may be femur defects also like versa and in some cases we might get some musculature abnormalities shortened and maybe because it is not a very high sciatic nerve injury is not likely until it's very high but that could be a one as it is not very high again a standard surgical approach might be sufficient for this level of surgery we may not really need an extensive approach as we have a specific situation that our estabulum is less it will definitely need augmentation and for that we will definitely need graft to be tapered and st- tailored to fit into the area and on a bone on a bed which is relatively made vascular enough added along with the graft uh, this thing we can find it out over the cancellous area put it over there but understanding that the coverage of the host bone has to be adequate uh, here is a case uh, with the uh, all the details given where we had all these issues and you can see it is just above the estabulum just along with the flattening the height is relatively less so we work up on the ct scans and now we get over to recreate that femur had a fragment shortened put over there and then we augment it with the the nestolar um, roof now the considering as dr rakesh told the size is very small we had to go for a cemented situation and here it is the post op here it is a four months follow up and this is the seven month follow which we had in our records in this case another factor which is seen is the medialization definitely because it being shallow we understand and we have talked about so called controlled reaming to reach the cotyledon process we need to protect the anterior wall because it is hypoplastic 
we may use the undersigned reamer to get the placement and ideally uncemented cup into the area. But what is most important is the reaming which has to be very appropriately done. Now here is a lady with the, uh, she is a doctor, she got this low level dysplasia and this is what is her uh, surgery and a four months follow up at this place. We have gone as medially but we could get a sufficient so we did not breach the medial cortex. This is her follow up for 24 months and this is our follow-up of 12 years now and she maintains a reasonable amount of emulation. Now, there could be the uh, false estable where we might have to go anatomically high. We only go anatomically high in this level if our uh, other procedures are not likely to be successful. Again, we will look for a cementless cup over into this area. Biomechanically, we all understand having to go and hire hip center is not an advantage. We have a lot of mechanically disadvantage for the abductors also. And with this situation, I put up a case here of a 40 years lady who had some surgeries done in between. <clears throat> Once she is there with us, we go to get this fixation at little higher level than the routine in this kind of a situation. And you can say this is a little higher than the normal. And the follow-up, this is four months follow-up and this is seven months follow-up. She still, because it is not a very good center, she still maintains a kind of a uh, limp over there, which is difficult to maintain. Now, there is another case where there is a post-traumatic situation. Now, the, we understand that when previous surgery has a uh, post-surgical uh, situation, then this might be little difficult. And here is a case where this level of a difficulty in her ambulation so we go into this area, I'm just going through. So this area, what we do, we reconstruct the estabulum with the bone graft augmentation. Again, you can see, and accordingly, we medialize also. So we need two things, augmentation as well as medialization, but we have been able to come to a normal center. And there in this situation, we have been able to get her a reasonably good gait. So she still maintain a kind of lip, which we feel is unacceptable compared to her previous situations. Post-operatively, we understand a standard care has to be given for this level, the weight bearing. As for outcome is concerned, there is no difference as per the literature between this level and a higher level. And overall, for the first six months, they are similar to non-dysplastic hips as per the literature. But at 15 years follow-up, we definitely have an issue. The revision rate is high. So DDH can be managed with the proper plan. Bone graft may be required, medialization is an option and where it is not possible, high center is required and definitely we have to care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen. Excellent. And uh, now we move on to the next uh, talk, which is uh, from Renal. He's going to talk about THR in high dysplasia. Over to you, Renal. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so high dysplasia usually include the heart of um, high dislocation in Croy type 4. And the anatomy is different. Obviously, uh, the abnormal abductors and they are obliquely placed. There is an hourglass contraction of capsule, hyperplastic acetabulum. And, but the most important thing is the abnormal course of the femoral nerve in the profunda femoris artery, which can get damaged in such severe deformities. Uh, obviously, the hyperplastic femoral canals are there. If you see that the best bone of acetabulum is usually seen at around 40 to 55 millimeters from the teardrop. This is where you might be able to place the Croy type 1, 2, 3 cups, you know, but for a high dislocation, you see the bone quality and the thickness reduces where it is always recommended that you reconstruct the acetabulum to its native hip center. It gives you the best bone. It restores the length of the abductors, restores the biomechanics to the best, needs reduction of steotomy, obviously, and it's very useful in Croy type 4B. Ranava triangle is very helpful on the x-rays uh, for us to decide where to put Intraoperatively, as I had already discussed, you follow the ligament teres, you insinuate into the capsule and you can reach the actual true acetabulum below the pseudo acetabulum, which is usually rarely seen in a type 4 croy. And inferior tal is the most important uh, place which can give you a landmark to where to place your cup. So you do the reaming and you try and put the cup in the re required version and the abduction. Uh, cotyloplasty or the deepening of the medial side has been discussed and it increases the coverage. 
if the coverage is uh, not beyond 70%, you might need to put in inlay grafts with two screws as described by Dr. Mohanty as well. Thermal reconstruction is usually done. Uh, I use a SROM stem in almost all my dysplasias, high dysplasias. I do the preparation of the stem first, uh, the sleeves, and then do a subtrochanteric osteotomy and uh, do the uh, subtrochanteric osteotomy. Now, the amount of soft tissues that needs to be released is very important. This paper tells you that you start releasing adductors, iliotibial band and gluteus maximus, iliosoas rectus and the sartorius, the piriformis and the hamstrings. And you might also need to remove the tenting osteophytes. Assess the abductors from the lag wing in very severe deformities or even pike resting of the abductors has been done by me in few cases. If you're not able to bring the acet the, uh, the head to the uh, native acetabulum, this is a case which has a high dislocation and you can see she has shortening and she's, unable, she's walking with the limb and you can see almost hypoplastic acetabulum on the CT scans and there is no bone where the actual dislocated head is placed. So I identified the acetabulum intraoperatively uh, and reconstructed it with S from stem, keeping, keeping it in the right anti-version. And uh, I used a derotation plate as well to protect. Another case, 39-year female with adduction contracture, uh, probably had been operated earlier uh, in childhood, and she walks with the limp and the shortening as well. And, uh, you know, the 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 head is not very uh, anti-verted, but I reconstructed it and brought it back to the native acetabular center. And the sleeve has been prepared. And the sh shortening has been done. Make sure that you mark your rotational osteotomy when you're doing the subtrochanteric osteotomy, which I usually do at 1 to 1.5 centimeters below the lesser trochanter. And that has to be reproduced. Once you've done the uh, final reduction, make sure that you're ma you've already marked uh, the osteotomy and the rotation has been reproduced. Another case where you can see this is the intraoperative stability, which I'm checking here. Uh, another case, 24-year female, high dislocation, again, hypoplastic acetabulum. I used a smallest size as uh, uh, this um, um, uncemented stem, uh, coral stem, <coughs> and did a derotation of the femur, proximal femur, and stabilized it with a derotation uh, plate. And this is the four-year follow-up of the same patient. And another patient, a uh, very interesting case of a proximal femoral focal deficiency, where the patient had a shortening of and the other leg was ending at the, the opposite knee. And you can see the video, this is her leg, how it was. I did an angioplasty also to see, uh, angiography also to see whether the vessels are not tenting or they're not into my operative field. And uh, you relocated, you know, found out the true acetabulum intraoperatively with the TAL, reconstructed it, and, you know, did a subtrochanteric osteotomy shortening, used a SROM stem in the correct version. And this is how the patient is walking now. And this was immediately three months post-op. I gave her extension processes and she was able to mobilize uh, perfectly in her home. And this is how she walked three months with the, the extension processes. And this is the four-year follow-up of the same patient. So high dislocations, it's very important that you do um, a reduction of stotomy. Use bantam cups, which are, you know, small size cups as already been de described. Grafts may be used if the cup is more than 30% uncovered. Anatomical hip center is the gold standard for uh, Croy type 4 and always use a modular stem if the antiversion is more than 30, 25 degrees. A shortening is always, always recommended for a limb length discrepancy more than 4 centimeters in high dislocations because there are very high chances if you don't do that, you'll injure the sciatic nerve. Thank you for a patient listening. Uh, thank you, Brunal. Uh, excellent talk. Now, we, now I'll pass it on to my co-chair, uh, Rajkumar, who's going to chair the next three talks. Rajkumar. Thank you, Dr. Satish, and uh, that's a great uh, going and a good meeting. Now, I'd like to, without wasting time, I'd like to uh, call upon Dr. Arshin to give his talk on THR in dysplastic hips with the previous astabular or a femoral osteotomy. Quite a challenging topic. Thank you very much. Hello for everybody, and uh, thank you for my invitation. I want to talk about the time arthroplasty and dysplastic hip with previous femoral and stabilostitomy. As you know, uh, incidence of competitive dislocation is 1% and the several types of femoral and stabilostitomy introduce a joint preserving procedures and low complication rate with good uh, long-term survival for all of the osteotomies around the stabilum and femoral side. Uh, but the osteoarthritis after osteotomy, uh, this with the favorative outcomes associated with corrective osteotomy, some patients will still develop degenerative change of the hip and may eventually require total replacement. Both dysplastic patients, 
that didn't undergo corrective osteotomy and those didn't present a distinct set of technical challenge on a subsequent total hip arthroplasty. The most important controversy is the previous osteotomy worsened the outcome of total hip arthroplasty in DDH or doesn't compromise the result of total hip. For few published studies are evaluating the outcomes of total hip after previous pre and proximal femoral osteotomy, and most of these studies had a small sample sizes and lack of compression groups of patients without the previous osteotomy. Total hip arthroplasty following previous failed pre osteotomy, uh, more uh, demanding due to worsened and altered bony anatomy of the astablum, angled on my rotated femur, and soft tissue contractures and damaged muscles and potential sciatic nerve and other nerve injury. Total hip arthroplasty after failed pre osteotomy had a higher uh, complications and postoperative blood loss and uh, complication rate and infection rate is higher in uh, this uh, kind of uh, group of patients. Astabular complement failure technique to obtain good astabular coverage and fixation is the main problem is a small components controlled astabular medialization and increased high of prosthetic hip center, hype center as I colleagues mentioned. You can see here the simulation of astabular components that you can see in uh, uh, number D that you ought to change the position of astabular better coverage for better results of total rotoplasty after previous operations and osteotomies. And as someone had undergone the rotational osteotomy often hardens more than uh, one without previous osteotomy and screw fixation is mandatory and uh, the uh, sclerotic bone can work uh, with uh, uh, screws well for better results of total arthroplasty. You can see some papers that uh, showed that the results midterm results similar to those of this dysplastic bit with previous uh, rotational osteotomy around the astablum and doesn't compromise the results as uh, you see in these papers. Shapira showed that pelvic osteotomy secondary to, uh, to dysplasia may entail some challenge, higher intraoperative blood loss, lower consistency in cup and possible compromise patient with reported outcomes. The distinct anatomy associated with post cohorts may result in different preoperative complication for this kind of patients. In the contralateral side, in the femoral side, medullary kind of narrowing calcification changes femoral alignment distortion of proximal femoral soft tissue contractures and change in the location of hip center leak lanes discrepancy, abductor and abductor insufficiency, hardware removal and increased risk of the uh, hardware uh, removal and risk of them. Femoral side previous osteotomy, as you see here, can be handled by total replacement. We ought to answer three questions. Does the staging hardware removal and totally decrease the risk of preoperative complications? The second question is, does the type of fixation, cemented or cementless, or implant, proximal versus distal fixed stems, affect interoperative fracture risk or stem survival? And the second question ought to be answered by the surgeon, does the type of femoral osteotomy influence likelihood of the late results and high level of durable pain relief and functional restoration by total replacement? We add to decision making for using cemented or cementless in cemented components, potential extravasation of the cement from empty holes is the main problem and gear price pressuration at the time of the prototype may influence the results of prototype replacement. In cementless component, optimal placement of the components may be difficult with abnormal femoral version of the displacement of the uh, displacement of the osteotomy fragments. You can see osteotomies around the uh, uh, femoral side for doing total replacement with the previous femoral deformities, previous femoral operations. And uh, the uh, Murat team showed that in a biomechanical study demonstrated that advocated rotational stability was maintained uh, with the most osteotomy except transfer osteotomy, but differences in terms of resistant uh, axial and rotational and lateral bending force among the four main osteotomy is used for femoral correction, including transverse osteotomy was similar. Galazi showed that the total rotoplasty after total replacement uh, after femoral osteotomy is technically more demanding and higher risk of complications. A stage hardware removal may reduce the risk of intraoperative fracture and fiction, 
and survival of total arthroplasty after femoral osteoplasty is uh, higher, but uh, it's uh, lower than uh, conventional total arthroplasty. You can see here a patient with previous femoral uh, osteotomy with uh, intra uh, medullary canal uh, mi migration of the plate necessary to decision making for a stage on the same session hardware removal. And uh, sometimes it is impossible to remove the hardware and plates because uh, many, many decades uh, passed from the operations and you have to decision making, use the longest stem or the standard Achim, stem for the patients. Go, go, the, go to the last, go to the last right. slide, In conclusion, the rate of complications is higher and the operative time is longer, the estimated blood loss is higher, total part is more demanding and revision rate is uh, are higher and prepare yourself for the worst scenario Good preoperative planning and operative skills are the main keys for successful conversions to the public replacement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Afshin. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Thadi Mohan to give an, his talk on role of uh, robotics in dysplastic hips, an interesting topic. Uh, thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, can you see my... I think you need to share your screen, uh, Tadi. It's not yet uh, come up. Yep. yep. Okay, so I work in the Amrita Institute of Medicines, Kochi, Kerala, India, and my topic today is the role of robotics in dysplastic hips. At the outset, I must tell you that uh, I haven't done any crow four or very high hips. Most of the hips I have done are fairly straightforward and not too difficult. So the imaging uh, for robotic hips is the same as uh, for uh, any other hips, the standard x are taken. AP, frog leg, long leg. Is also take lateral views of the lumbar spine in sitting and standing position because uh, we calculate the sacral the pelvic index and that has got some bearing in the software. So the main mainstay of my planning for this is to the hip protocol and a personalized CD reconstruction plan is created so that we have a digital bony model of the bone. As you will see, we can work in any case the degree cup can be moved superiorly, inferiorly, or medially based on the mid I mean, bone stock. We ensure uh, at least 70% coverage uh, within the anterior and posterior columns. We don't want to move an overhang and we don't want to miss the osteophytes. The same can be planned very accurately as well. Uh, with regards to size, everything can be accurately planned, including level of the neck cut. The implant we ensure is centered just inside the femoral cortices. And even with hip replacement, I have a good idea of what cup size I'm using. What is uh, the plant then? What is my version? Uh, also know what is the limb length of uh, difference? What is the come of set I have to make up? Uh, they visualize where there might be bony or cup line impingement and adjust the cup position accordingly. And here I've got a short video where you can see 
<clears throat> the cup inclination is uh, the default values version is 20 degrees <clears throat> sorry and depending on where the impingement is occurring as the red spot show you can reduce the version 14 from 20 and the uh, 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 impeachment can be taken care of similarly we know how much uh, or where uh, the linkage in uh, sitting position as well so this is the op uh, operation theater setup the maker robot is uh, draped for every case in a sterile drape the mps is the maker product specialist or the technical engineer who's going to uh, feed in the numbers uh, he's got a guidance console the monitor and the camera are at the head end of the patient uh, uh, next to the surgeon. So the first thing is uh, establishing a communication between uh, the, the patient's hip and the robot. And I do that by putting a pelvic array on the iliac crest and using a special probe and touching about 45 points in and around the acetabulum. And uh, now we're ready to go. So this is the reaming view. And the green tells me how much bone I have to ream in each case. Um, I make sure uh, it's uh, uh, you know adequately balanced. Uh, I know that once I start reaming, I should not uh, be on the white, the white me that I have reached adequate reaming. And this is actually very useful in dysplastic hips where you don't want to perforate the medial wall. Uh, and the moment you see red, you stop. So you ream until all the green goes. So it's a single ream. Uh, but sometimes I start off with a smaller reamer in, in uh, dysplastic hips where where the, the shape of the uh, acetabulum is oval. It's sort of hemispherical and then build it up on that. So the uh, reamer you can see is uh, um, attached to the robotic arm. And uh, once we start reaming, we are looking at how the green is turning to white um, and stop accordingly. So the cup impaction is also very straightforward. The robotic arm again comes into use here. The cup is attached to the robotic arm, uh, placed in the position exactly that you want it in. That is, you have planned, for example, 40-20. So you can put it in that position exactly. And then as you are hitting it, you will see that you are going deeper and deeper and, and uh, you have reached the correct depth. So this is just a... a Animation showing the same, sorry about the video, I think it's not very clear. Uh, and reduction can be checked at a, uh, even uh, once you've impacted with means of a probe. And here you can see the inclination and the version are almost what has been planned. So a few cases here, um, row three hip uh, with a 4.5 centimeter LLD, which has been uh, uh, robotically replaced. Uh, I put a structural allograph there because of uh, the coverage uh, was not adequate, I felt. Uh, this is a, a much more straightforward uh, 3.2 centimeter LLD, uh, which has been uh, nicely replaced. Uh, this is one of my patients with a, uh, who's a very heavy, 140 kilos with a high BMI as well. And it was critical that we put his hip in the right place. And uh, here he is. Uh, walking happily a uh, few days after Mohan, could you go to your take-home message, please? Yeah, the points are 3D CT scan is, is an excellent tool uh, um, for pre-planning. It The robot helps in precise positioning and stem placement, um, cuts down humor error, and long-term outcomes will be better, hopefully. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thadi. Now I'd like to call upon Dr. Rajiv Sharma to give his talk on managing the complications in a THR for a dysplastic hip. Thank you, Rajkumar. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, Oliver. I, I've been asked to speak on the management of the complications of dysplastic hip arthroplasty, which is when you do not follow all the tricks and tips of the surgery, what has been discussed by previous speakers. It is not always a happy situation like this. And possible complications are the fractures of femur or the, or the cup, infection, uh, dislocation, nerve palsy, migration of the cup, or the premature component loosening. 
Now look at this patient, 57-year-old female, dysplastic pro 4, probably a, uh, what, what uh, uh, Fatih has discussed, subtrochanteric osteotomy should have been done, but the surgeon avoided doing the subtrochanteric osteotomy and, res and the result was the shattered proximal femur. And not only that, but she also had the infection. We had to do the surgery by a two-stage uh, gold standard. The three months post uh, mega prosthesis using a constrained liner, the patient had an excellent function. At uh, six years, uh, she was having the excellent function and the placement of the prosthesis was good. The uh, bone uh, has formed all around the proximal part of the prosthesis and she had a mild limb, but uh, most of the gluteal, gluteus medius was able to function reasonably well. The another big issue could be that if you do too much of reaming, like if you are if you are trying, trying to uh, ream the middle wall, if you do too much of reaming, this kind of a situation may occur which should be avoided by careful preoperative planning. And if that happens, the biggest challenge is the how to extract this cup. If it is a cemented cup, it is still easier. But if you remove a, a cementless cup, it is difficult and you must be very careful about it. You must do a CT angiogram and be sure that how far the eyelid vessels are uh, from the middle side of the cup. And then after careful dissection, uh, you can check it out. By a separate incision, you can control the eyelid vessels so that in case there is a bleeding, you are not uh, in for a surprise. Now, after removing the cup, you can put the cementless or cemented uh, cup and cup and uh, cage system uh, the, using the bone graft of the patient and artificial bone. The fixation could be reasonably good, like what you see here, the cementless cage and a cup placement. And that's the patient at one year and that's the patient at uh, uh, five years. The mild kind of a limp could be possible in these patients because of the uh, the media, ma, ma, some, some amount of inefficiency of the gluteus medius, but these patients are, are having these fairly stable uh, hip prosthesis. In cases like this, achondroplasic patients, the history of preoperative history, uh, the patient's preoperative, uh, the earlier surgeries of the patient is very important. Like in this patient, left side, she had the, uh, the Elizabeth fix surgery done for the lengthening of the femur and tibia. She had a small socket, uh, so we, have, we were prepared with the 38 and 40 size of the socket. We could do well on both the sides. The patient was, was walking around, but the, the, in these cases, looking at the preoperative, uh, the earlier surgery history, there was an Elizabeth surgery. This patient had an infection on the left side where, where, the, where the Elizabeth surgery was done, the two-stage uh, gold standard surgery, and then after the uh, final prosthesis fixation, this is the patient at four years. There is no recurrence of the infection in this, this case. The dislocation could be another big issue in all these cases, especially the crow four. Finding out the estabulum is very difficult, native estabulum, uh, where, where to put the cup, how to give, give, put a cup in a well-fixed position. Now, this patient, uh, we could see on the CT scan that there was a, a small amount of the cup, narrow cup. Uh, we put uh, these, the narrow part of the uh, femoral head was removed the whole uh, cup was used, but we could see that on the left side, the cup placement was good, but on the right side, it looked like a slightly more antiverted patient had a dislocation at two weeks. Uh, we reduced it and we saw on the table that the antiverter was within the acceptable limits. So I, I, what we did was we did a plaster on both the sides for a period of three weeks and then careful planning and we could see that this patient was actually having the hyperlexity of the most of the other joints also, which could have been one of the reasons why this patient had a dislocation. That's the patient at 16 months, a uh, patient is able to uh, do the reasonable function. Um, many activities which probably we would avoid these patients to do, but they are able to do it. They, have, they, will, they may have mild amount of uh, lurch because of the gluteus uh, inefficiency, but the patients are able to function uh, in, in a good way. The another uh, big complication that could be is that if you put a cup in cage and the cup can migrate proximally and then it can endanger the important structures. This is the patient nine years post-surgery and you see this patient presented with a massive swelling in the, in the thigh and when we operated and we suspected of the ultrasound and uh, CT, we found out that there is a possibility and there was a damage to the artery and what we could see here 
but we see that there was a damage to the ileic vessels. The, 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 what was required was the careful, uh, careful exploration and the venous graft, uh, which was taken, vein was taken from the uh, nearby area, and we could uh, get away from this massive complication. The conclusions are that careful preoperative planning is very important. History of previous surgery is also very important. CT scan should be done in most of the cases to understand the three-dimensional anatomy and CT angio, especially in a, in a patient where you have a medially migrated cup, careful medial wall reaming, otherwise you may have a problem. Uh, under reaming and over reaming, both are the big issues. Subtrochantric osteotomy, if it is indicated, which we just discussed in the last session, should be Done if it is indicated, and in all revision cases, infection needs to be ruled out. And also, if the patient has had the Elizarov surgery or similar other surgery where there is a history of infection, it should be taken into the account very carefully. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rajiv. I think uh, we have seven minutes for discussion. Am I correct, Dr. Oliver? Yep, please. Okay, I think uh, there was a question in the chat box. Uh, about uh, 3D printing in the preoperative planning. So, any any of the panelists would like to take upon in or anybody has got an experience in 3D printing? Do they do routinely in your practice? Uh, not in dysplastic hip, but we do 3D printing in revision situations, complex revision situations, and complex primary hips. But uh, and they want to dis know in uh, dysplastic yeah. hips. Dysplastic hips, we are, I have not never done a 3D printing. Plastic hips are okay. pretty straightforward morphology. It's like geometry, two and two is four. So if you have mm -hmm. to basically correctly identify what kind of a dysplasia you are working with, where the issue with uh, complexity is uh, in situations where you have the variations of uh, the dysplasia, where you have the virus necks, the elongated uh, detrochantric overgrowth, the elongated necks, that is where one needs to kind of uh, 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 juggle around with what one can do. But uh, as far as 3D printing is concerned, it's it's of no added value when it comes to this plastic hips. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it yeah, could be in... So Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, it could be in certain cases where you have a complication, uh, complicated uh, uh, revisions in an earlier dysplastic hip. Probably in those cases where you have a uh, deficient estabulum, uh, probably there you can, you, this may be indicated. Um, and uh, let us uh, mention here that our next webinar of Indian Arthroplasty Association is on the 3D pr printing on 23rd of this month. Thank you. I agree with what yes, I've said. Tradish, in, in a straightforward dysplastic hips, uh, 3D printing is, is not required because you, you would follow the anatomy as we has been described very well throughout the webinar and you will find what you need and the implants are, are available. However, in certain situations, I agree very rarely, like for previous operations, multiple implants, yeah. uh, lots of uh, deficiencies, then yes, it can have a role. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, the uh, the uh, role of 3D printing, uh, as it has been discussed here, is not that much uh, really helpful in a dysplastic hip. Uh, any other questions uh, we have uh, Afsan, from the panelists? You to, Afsan, you want to say something? Yes, I want to mention about the uh, importance of other techniques of uh, proximal shortening. I do, in my experience, for more than 3,000 3, of uh, DTH type four cases, proximal diagnostic femoral shortening was performed. Any herpetic and hip surgeon ought to be familiar with other kind of techniques because sometimes, uh, as a matter of fact, some uh, surgeons that uh, do distal femoral shortening or subtrochantric uh, femoral shortening osteotomy due to some problems are not able to do that and ought to be familiar with other techniques. Proximal diagnostic femoral shortening osteotomy is working well and if you do in a well and good skills of uh, this technique, you can have a very good results and the uh, concerns of trochantric lung union can be handled by abrasion of osteomal and reattachment of trochantric fragment with triple wiring technique and bone graft. Thank you, Epson. One of the other questions that came up was high hip center. Does anyone accept a high hip center? And if so, when? Can, I, can I comment on this, Dr. Satish? Yeah, please do. 
yeah so uh, in my uh, practice uh, all the dysplastic hips uh, how i practice is like a uh, little bit uh, reasonably straight forward like what type 1 and 4 i always try to uh, put it in the anatomical hip center and if it is type 2 and 3 th- those are the most uh, challenging ones in regards to the acetabulum so i almost always avoid uh, bone grafts or a metal augments so when we talk about complications these are the two things which really matters much and uh, so for to avoid that i always keep around 1.5 to 2 cm maximum from the tear drop and then always as uh, it was uh, seen in the uh, talks that three important points here i follow that is one is medialize the cup smallest cup possible and then uh, not to take it too much high also so medialization small cup avoid lateralization if we follow that i think uh, the high hip center is also not a good uh, bad uh, option okay thank you i think we got one minute left so rajiv Uh, yeah one of the indication could be of the high hips uh, accepting the high hip center in patient where you have a or dislocated hip the hip the femoral head is lying above crow 3 and the patient's limb, limb length is equal because some of these patients by a uh, by a, by a, by a process of natural uh, equalization of both the legs they may have the crow 3 but they may, they may have a uh, equal uh, limb length in these cases if you bring the head down the actually the operated side will become actually the longer side especially in a unilateral uh, ddh probably there also and also as rajkumar has rightly mentioned if you have a right amount of bone uh, in these cases it can be accepted that high hip center can be accepted thank you i think to But finish off, limit yeah to finish off i pass it on to ronan and ronald Well, thank you, Satish. I mean, I think uh, I just hope that the people watching the webinar have enjoyed it as much as we put it in, enjoyed putting it together for you. And uh, I think it's been a real pr- privilege to work alongside Sikot. And uh, on behalf of the IA, I would really look forward to more such collaborations in the future. And uh, I think I would be remiss if I didn't thank all our speakers from all around the world. Uh, and uh, Thank you for a wonderful evening gentlemen and for spending the time to put things forward and I'd like to ask Rinald to put in his comments because he's the one who's actually helped to patch this entire thing together right from day one so over to you Rinald Thank you thank you Dr Ronan thank you Oliver and Satish I think we have had a comprehensive in-depth discussion on all aspects of dysplastic hips and how to reconstruct with the total hip arthroplasty including the robotics so i think our audience has going to they are going to benefit from uh, you know uh, a discussion which started from the basics and uh, to the advanced so i thank all the speakers everyone all the moderators and across the globe who found out time uh, to contribute to this webinar and make it a success thank you thank you thank, thank you all everyone. yeah thank you everyone i would like to close in on behalf of uh, cicot and cicot uh, uh, committee um thank you for this fantastic webinar we have many tricks many tips for the daily practice so i will try to push the speakers to put this in a paper and try to do a publication in in any secret publication with all the tips and tricks so all the attendees can see in a paper and just to read and and just to to, to see the, the the small details thank you everyone and i hope to see you in the next hip webinars that we have every month thank you thank you everyone thanks thank you everyone. Thank, thank you everyone thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. bye have a nice evening. thanks for joining everyone bye.